mine sitting in the back. Oh my goodness. You guys can sit closer if you want. That's fair, that's fair. But there's not that many of them, so you could still sit in the front. Okay, I think we've got, I think we've got everyone in here. Uh, are, is the live stream go? Yes? Okay, awesome. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to, for those of you who are uh, new to coming today, welcome to the California Nanosystems Institute. My name is Rita Blake, and I have had the pleasure of uh, directing this program this week applications of nanoscience, uh, and today is our final presentations. Uh, I also want to say hello to everyone who is watching us on the live stream. Uh, we know you couldn't be here today in person, but thank you for uh, still joining us, and we hope that you enjoy the presentations as well. And speaking of which, just a few housekeeping things before I roll in and get started. Uh, first, just as a reminder to everyone, UCLA still has an indoor masking policy in place, so unless you are actively eating or drinking, please keep your masks on. We've been relatively COVID-free as far as I'm aware, and I'm hoping that we keep it that way. So please have your masks on, again, unless you're eating or drinking. Uh, second thing is, uh, for our presenters, please do not forget to speak into the mic, both so that people in here can hear you better and so that everyone watching on our live stream can hear you because if you're not speaking into the mic well enough, no one will be able to hear what you're saying online. So please do that and we will remind you if you know, we're picking up that it's not loud enough for people to hear. Um, also, when we get into Q and A's, we will take the two mics that are the mobile mics and pass them to whoever is asking a question. So for those of you who are asking questions and we invite everyone to ask questions, please also be sure that you speak into the mic. But with that, Let's get into the fun part of today. So our mission at the CNSI is uh, really quite interesting as an institute because we are not a traditional academic department on campus. Uh, we don't grant degrees. Uh, what we do is that we are an interdisciplinary research institute that's focused around everything nanoscience related. But what that means is not only do we facilitate research and try to do interesting things with nanoscience education, but we also have a nanotechnology, or uh, excuse me, a technology startup incubator on campus that has about 25, I believe at the moment, startup companies. And so the thing that I really love about this summer program in particular is that it does a really great job of integrating all aspects of what we do as an institute. And it really gives students a very interesting opportunity that they don't get in most places and that that even that undergrads won't get, that grad students won't get, and that most faculty won't get either, which is to not only see how technology is, is invented at the early research stage, but then how can technology be taken from just an idea into something that actually goes out into the world and affects people's lives. So it's really about that full translational process of science. And that's something, again, that is exceedingly rare to get as an education and to understand. And so that's what I love about this program especially, and it's what all of our wonderful students this week have experienced in a very, very quick and condensed two weeks. So I'm really excited to see these final presentations today. 
because I love seeing what can be possible when really, really smart minds work together to create something in a very short period of time. Uh, but there's a lot of people that I need to thank to, uh, that took us to get to this point. Um, it really takes a village to put this program together. Um, I, I can't even, if I spent the whole time thinking every single person that was involved, I would probably be up here for at least 30 minutes, but I'm gonna spare us all that and highlight just a few. Uh, so first, uh, my left and right brain respectively are uh, <laughs> Dr. Elaine Morita, who is our program coordinator, and Dr. Shailene Tanemoto, who is our education manager. Uh, they have both been so integral to helping make sure that all the pieces are together in this program, both just from a practical standpoint and from a pedagogy standpoint. So Elaine and Shailene, thank you both so much, so, so, so much. Also, we, we cannot function in this program without our fantastic group of instructors. Uh, we've been working on preparing this program for months and these group of instructors here really sort of have taken the reins and really helped to make this program a very fun and personal experience, both I think for them and for the students. So I definitely wanna give each of them a shout out, uh, Omar Leon and Lily Shang. Uh, Dima Vido, who is not here at the moment because he is getting sworn in as a citizen of the United States today, this morning. So yay, Dima. <laughs> And hopefully he should be here at some point and then we'll also be asking questions. Uh, Pia Ramos, uh, Sasha, Sasha Gil-Lunghammer, yay, Sasha, and Leave, our part-time instructor, Leave. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Not only did they help to develop the curriculum for this program, by the way, but they were also here for the second week really working sort of one-on-one -on -one and hands-on with the student teams, essentially serving as principal investigators for these groups, really guiding the students along and helping them out with all the different aspects of their projects. So thank you all so much, not only for your time, but your knowledge and your expertise. You guys are fantastic. Uh, I also have to thank, again, a lot of people who work behind the scenes that really are critical to helping things function. Uh, first of all, uh, Mark, who I believe is in the back right now helping make sure the live stream is good. He's over there. Hi, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> and also Jeremy, who is back there, our media, media team, who are awesome. Thank you both. Uh, Mitch Mangoba, who is our events manager, who also helped to just make sure things were flowing easily and quickly and seamlessly. And uh, Jion Yim, who is uh, one of our fantastic uh, work-study students who helped to just make sure you know, supplies were ready, things were cleaned, people were signed in. I mean, just all these little things. We really need all of these people to, to help us work so well. So thank you all. I also wanna thank the CNSI Tech Center staff who opened their doors to their labs so that students could see some of the really cool technologies that we have in the building and how those relate to discovery. So thank you to all of the, uh, the Tech Center staff shown and also the extra staff who work with them to help, uh, help make the tours really interesting. And also a shout out to uh, Sonia Luna and Nikki Lin our uh, executive director and director of entrepreneurship and commercialization respectively for both lending their expertise into helping develop the financial models that students use and also being around as uh, sort of office hour guides to help the students with the business and the finance plans because we definitely know some of it but they are the true experts so a lot of their guidance was really really critical in helping to make sure that uh, we were giving students the tools that they needed to really understand what it's like, not just, again, to invent a technology, but how to actually make it into a product that goes out there and can be successfully sold. And finally, and I'm sure she will want to come up and say some words as well before we start, um, I, of course, have to acknowledge the person that without whom none of this would be happening, which is uh, Professor Sarah Tolbert, who is both the faculty director of our whole education program and also uh, our instructor of record for this course. Uh, she is a professor in the UCLA departments of chemistry and in material science, and she's also one of the researchers here at the California Nanosystems Institute. So, Sarah, thank you and welcome.
<laughs> yeah. I'm short. I always have to just tip it down. <laughs> Actually, can I? Oh, it's on a. You can, you can use one of these other ones if you want. <laughs> I am sufficiently short that if I stand behind this, nobody's going to see anything because that's pretty much all there is of me. Um, okay, so it is a real pleasure to uh, get to add my welcome to these um, final presentations. And I just want to say, you know, so I've talked to the students not as much as I wanted. I was out of town at the very beginning of our, of our um, session. Um, but this is really a unique opportunity that I wish I had had when I was in high school, but for sure I didn't. Um, and so there's a couple levels on which I think that this class gives people a taste of what they can do with, with life. So in the first place, normally when you are in science, you have a lab guide and your grade is based on following that lab guide to the perfect letter. And the more perfectly you can reproduce exactly what the teacher expected of you, the better the grade you get. And I have high school students and I can tell you I have seen this. Um, very rarely do you realize that science is not about doing that. Science is about making up the lab guide. So coming up with the experiment, not necessarily doing it right the first time, taking your failed results and using those to create a new and better lab guide, and then repeating your experiments until you can actually learn something from the process. So the first thing that I hope this class has taught all of you is that Science is not a straight line. Real science is not a straight line. It's a very zigzag process where you try something, you learn from why it doesn't work, and that the little bit of opportunity to create your own experiments during this second week has given you a chance to see that no success ever comes as planned. And that's really important if any of you want to be scientists or engineers because that's what you're going to discover in real life. Um, and um, I can say, as somebody who does admissions for my graduate, the graduate programs in my department, that that's what we look for in graduate students, somebody who understands that science is not a straight line, um, because those are the people who will succeed as actual scientists and engineers in the real world. Um, the other thing that I hope you've gotten from this um, program is some understanding of the weird and tight interplay between business and technology. And um, I, I gave all the students a talk about a small company that I helped to found. And I have to say, before that process, I had no understanding of the relationship between business and technology. I think that at the beginning, we all think, if somebody comes up with a great new invention that enables a new thing, that will make a new product and it will make money. And the reality is so much more complicated than that. The greatest new invention that costs too much to implement will never get implemented. And the simplest thing that's really clever and fills a need can make a huge amount of money. And so I think that at least getting a glance at this introduction to business and the very non-straightforward relationship between new tech, new ideas, and market need and practical applicability is something that rarely do people see at this point in their life and that it can really shape what you choose to major in in college and what graduate programs you choose to go to. So I'm super excited that you've gotten to learn this, oh, maybe 30 years before I got to learn this <laughs> in my past. Um, because there it really is a huge opportunity at that intersection of tech and business, but it requires significant knowledge of both. Um, so can I talk a little bit about presentations? Okay, okay, so what you're gonna hear now is that groups of students are going to give presentations on their um, proposed new product. And so these are based on defined labs that everybody did during the first week where we actually knew the procedure and we knew how to make them work and they mostly worked. I mean, nothing always works. Um, 
But then students got to pick a lab. They got to pick groups that they were interested in working in and come up with a new product idea that is related to those groups, to, those, to that technology, and then do some extra experiments, try to prove that something might work, and try to actually come up with a full business plan for how you would make that product into a reality. So students are going to present on this. You all are the audience, and you have a job to do. Your job is to ask them questions. And if you don't ask them questions, we're going to like glare at you until some people <laughs> ask questions. But more importantly, your job is to protect your children. Because if you don't ask them questions, I'm going to ask them <laughs> questions. I'm probably going to ask them questions anyway, but I'll ask them more questions if you don't ask any questions. And to the students, I want you to remember what I said before. Everything, so, biz, so products have to have um, the potential to make money. They have to have a sound market plan. They have to have scientific reality. So please try to explain to us the scientific reality in addition to all those other incredibly important things. Um, and you know my questions are all going to be about the scientific reality because although I started the company, I am not the business person for this company. <laughs> and so um, we will try to have all flavors of questions. Um, but please, to the audience, as you're listening, think about the questions because when the speaker says, okay, who has questions? Really hard to think about questions at that moment. Whenever I'm at a talk, I always think all the way through, oh, that could be a question. That could be a question. So store them up. Um, the other thing is for the student speakers, I can tell you when my graduate students go off to conferences and present in front of, you know, big name Nobel laureates, they're not ever worried about presenting. We practice presenting. Everybody knows if you practice well, you can give a great talk. The thing everybody is afraid of is the questions because you don't know what the questions are going to be. And so the only way to get over that is to just stand up in front of people and answer questions that you don't know the answer to. And you realize it's actually not that hard, but practice is the only way to do it. Okay, so I think that that is all I have. I will turn it back over to Rita, and then we will get started. All right, yeah, we're just gonna, we're just gonna come go and get started. So first group to go today is Pet Patch. So team Pet Patch, come on up. And let's, yeah, give all our teams a round of applause. Hello everyone, thank you so much for making it out today. I hope you're all having a great morning. Uh, my name is Nicholas John and these are all my amazing partners. My name is June Kim. My name is Christopher Kim. I am Michael Filgis. I'm Hannah Suzuki. And so before we get started, I have a quick question for everyone. Who here has a pet? Just raise your hand if you have a pet. Now keep your hand up if you would go to the ends of the world and back to see your pet happy and healthy. Okay. <laughs> I hope everyone's hand stayed up. Well, if so, we have the perfect product for you. From our company, Palmer's, we present the Pet Patch. So our mission is to speed up the recovery process of white animal injuries and to make the healing process non-irritable for pets. And our values are the overall wellness of animals and easily accessible and affordable pet medicines to owners. And so we're not, we want to start we want to start by addressing the problem that we want to solve. So according to American Veterinary Medical Association, um, the number of pet owners in American households has increased from 57% to 68% for the past six years. It also means a huge increase in demand of pet care products, just like bandages. However, we can all agree on that human bandages are ineffective for pets. 
they, most importantly, stick to fur, which causes irritated skin and leads to biting or scratching, and therefore no more treatment is available for the pet. This brings us to the conclusion that bandages that are suitable for pets are a necessity. Now, from the business perspective, so you guys might wonder if it's worth it to invest in a pet or um, animal care product. However, just like the number of pet owners, the pet market is also growing really fast. As you can see in this graph, it is even predicted to reach over $300 billion in the year of 2027. And now moving on to the science part, the nanoscience technology behind our product is called biopolymers. Polymers are large molecules linked by a chemical bonding, and biopolymers are basically just polymers made from natural sources. And for example, we have like sugar, trees, and gelatin for gummy bears and stuff like that. And if you've ever seen any kind of those green biodegradable, reusable bags from a supermarket, they're also biopolymer products because they're made of natural sources. And our product uses the same mechanism, which means that they will degrade in soil um, over a certain time. So another characteristic of biopolymer products is that they are biocompatible, which means it causes no harm for living tissue, just like our pet patch is not harmful for a pet's body at all. So we are producing the pet patch. It is a medicinal gel bandage designed for domestic animals to heal light cuts and scratches. It provides many advantages, such as its bite resistance due to a bitter apple spray taste, many healing properties such as accelerated he healing and being antibacterial, its biopolymer structure allowing it to be biodegradable, and its ability to be dissolved off at no harm to the animal or its fur. How it works. Our ointment is comprised of four main components, one of which is lactic acid, which is an anti-inflammatory and anti-pathogen gel that makes up the ointment. And another is acetic acid, which is used to dissolve chitosan. The other two components are chitosan and gelatin, which are both biopolymers. Chitosan can be commonly found in bug and crustacean exoskeletons, and here makes gel firm and sturdy to prevent damage to the bandage from internal or external sources. And then, meanwhile, gelatin is well known for being the light snack jello. And it here combines with chitosan to further increase its strength. Both of these will also easily break down. Lastly, there's a light adhesive border to keep it adhered to the animal. Okay, so now for the most fun and also kind of frustrating part sometimes, the experimentation. So one of the main elements of our product is this lactic acid ointment. And we chose lactic acid because it's been shown to speed up wound healing and have antimicrobial properties. So we wanted to test whether our patch would be able to absorb this lactic acid and then release it into the wounds of pets to help with the healing process. So to do this, we took a plastic bead imitating our patch and we placed it in a solution of lactic acid with a pH of about three. We let it swell for 45 minutes and then we moved it over to a solution of water with a pH of seven. And over time we found that the pH went from seven to four over 18 minutes, which meant that the lactic acid had been absorbed by the bead and released into the water. And this is essentially what we want our pet patch to be able to do, absorb this lactic acid ointment and then release it onto the pets. So for our next experiment, we wanted to test the firmness of various gels. And we tested their strength by stacking pennies onto the gel until it broke, and then we recorded all that data onto this chart over here. We found that with a lower concentration of chiozan, as you can see from this purple line, we could produce a gel that was stronger than gelatin. And when we use higher concentrations of chiozan, it actually, the strength decreased. So we, in the future, would like to test more gels and decrease the concentration of chiozan even further so we can create even sturdier gels. We'd also like to introduce um, cross linkers such as glyceraldehyde to further reinforce our gel. Another main selling point of our product is that it's able to easily dissolve. So we need to find that perfect ratio between a strong gel and one that is able to dissolve. So we just need more testing to be able to do that. And now to the competition. So as bandages for pets is a relatively new concept, there are not many ba companies making bandages for pets. However, there are some products that are similar to the pet patch. Our competitors are Bitter Flexible Bandage by Well and Good and Blue Butter by Fortisept. The Bitter Flexible Bandage is easy to use and it has a bitter taste that prevents the pet from biting it off. However, there is no healing properties, it is not biodegradable, and only treats dogs. Blue Butter has healing properties and is biodegradable, 
but it is messy and does not have a bitter taste. It also only targets dogs. But our product, the Pet Patch, is easy to use, has a bitter taste, has healing properties, is biodegradable, and treats all pets. In the future, we would like to create bandages that can treat a wider variety of injuries, including deep cuts and open wounds, and a wider variety of animals, including farm animals and zoo animals. In our first year, we will focus on development, where we will conduct research and experimentation on breaking down the gel. We will have a US patent, we will create a model bandage, produce 20,000 boxes worth, and it will cost around $775,000. In our second year, we will be focusing on fully launching our product, and we will spend a good deal of money on advertisement and marketing. We will then produce 40,000 more boxes, all for a cost of 840,000 total. In our third year, we'll focus on market growth. We will expand our business, grow in size, widen the variety of usage, and produce 60,000 boxes, all for a total of $905,000. As we can see here, we don't make any profit in the first two and a half years, but in the middle of year two, we begin to see a profit. By year four, we hope to have paid off all the initial investments we made in year one. Market analysis. The animal healthcare global market value was $139 billion in 2020, and it is predicted to reach upward of $190 billion in the American alone. There is a huge market already available of nine 49 billion. Customers and consumers. Customers for pet patch are pet owners, pets, local pharmacy stores, and online pet pharmacy. Consumers for pet patch are animals, pets, and pet owners. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. And remember, when your pet gets a scratch, yeah. use the pet, pet patch. patch. Thank you, Wonder wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, it seemed to me if I look at your competitor list, one of your standout points is that you've got uh, other attributes that are pharmacological attributes like antimicrobial uh, effects and healing. Uh, it's not clear to me from what you presented how much of your early R&D dollars would be invested in actually demonstrating through clinical studies that you actually meet that and that would seem to me to be important to actually uh, drive your sales and have a key discrimination in your product. Maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, so for medical approval, is that what you're asking about? Like getting it approved? Well, I work in uh, drug development, so I'm very used to regulated environments yeah. and, and approval. And I think in this market, you could probably sell this, I don't know though, uh, by a variety of ways. But indeed, you know, with the medical approval mm -hmm. route, you have greater ability to really differentiate from competition. Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, that was one of the hurdles that we were facing. And originally, we wanted to make something for humans, but we found that the, the FDA stuff for human products is it's just so it's such a high border to hit. It's so much diffi more difficult, so we moved to pets. And we found that there's actually ways, if you have a product that has elements of other products that have been approved, you can actually get through that process much faster. And so that's sort of the path that we want to be looking down. Uh, great. I appreciate that. What I would say, living in that FDA space, what it affords you to do is actually bank on your claims yeah. where your competitors can just turn around and, and change maybe the labeling on their package and, and, and effectively compete with you without, uh, without the weight of evidence that, that you could bring. And I guess then on a, on a technical side, you mentioned strength, uh, the strength of your uh, polymers. Um, how do you view the... Uh, balance between the elastic nature because you know the pets you can't tell them to not move around and that yeah. would seem to be one of the one of the uh, physical attributes that would be essential to the performance of your product so y that that part is definitely going to require a lot more testing and a lot more time we need to really focus on maybe even trying whole new combinations maybe we don't use kyozin but it all just depends on research which is which might take longer than just one year but yeah i think we can get it
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is awesome. This is just an example that, like, you're thinking about something real, which is incredibly cool. Okay, I have a question, which is, you talked about you can't use regular Band-Aids, the whole fur thing, but you didn't really talk much about adhesion and fur and that problem. So you said you'd have a light adhesive. Could you talk a little bit more? I mean, the, the gels are great and stretchy and hold stuff and keep things moist, and so I think all those issues are really well covered. What about the fur and the adhesive part? Yeah. And I'm going to pause and ask that maybe somebody else can share. Yeah, yeah you guys got to share. <laughs> So we actually wanted to include this analogy of someone's hair to that part. But if I were to put a bandage on his head right here, it's which is just like a furry skin of a dog, he would have to, <laughs> he would have to shave the part where he has the injury. And we would have to like peel the bandage and all that, put it right there. And it will hurt him very much when I take it off. And so that was like the main focus we wanted to kind of go for. And we just did not want to cause any pain in the animal, like in the pet. So that's why we um, figured out the way the formula, uh, the formula gel. And so we wouldn't like have like this. It would still have the sticky part to stay on the f the injury. However, it wouldn't um, hurt the animal when you take it down because when you take it off because it's uh, biodegradable. It's like um, it's like more um, it's like more like eco friendly. And so. Is it is it a preformed gel, or is it that you're going to make the gel on the animal? Because if you gel. made it on the animal, it would move between the fur. If you, if it's a preformed gel, it's still going to go on top. It, it. Yes. The the getting it off dissolving part is good, yes. but getting it to reach the wound may still have some issues. But possibly stage two products could be things where you basically cast them onto the wound. That's the cool thing about these hydrogels. Um, yeah. One more question. Parent, student, students, you're allowed to ask other students questions, by the way. You're allowed to ask them easy questions, even. One more question. Think about your pets. Yay. Okay, uh, what was the biggest problem you faced when inventing this like pet patch idea? Like what was the biggest hurdle or challenge that you o like that you faced? Sorry, one moment. <laughs> uh, well, at first we weren't totally confident if our mixture would work and we had to we had to change our mixture a lot. We had to go between lots of products on the fly cuz uh there were so many different gels that came into this process, but none of them were available. So like in the span of a day, we came up with like three different versions of this product, but we finally got stuff that we had accessible. I guess that would be our main problem that we had along the way. And when you're not doing it in two days during a summer program, you can actually buy stuff from like random vendors and in two weeks they will appear in your lab, which is helpful, but not quite applicable to a program like this. Okay, let us thank this group for a really awesome starter presentation. All right, uh, group two, Nitrix, come on up. Sense this one. This one. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm Sophia. Geraldo. I'm Natalie. Uh, and together we are Nitrix, and today we are going to be presenting to you guys our product, which is known, uh, which are known as the night beads. 
So, as some of you may know, nitrogen is a primary nutrient that's necessary for plant growth, and therefore, it's an essential component of crop fertilizers. But when excess nitrogen is not used by crop plants, it converts to nitrates and, move foods and moves the groundwater into the soil. This contaminated groundwater then seeps into wells and water systems that then humans consume. Um, consuming too much nitrate can cause uh, your blood to carry uh, oxygen uh, in a different way, and then it can cause your skin to turn blue, and it can cause other, other symptoms such as increased bl uh, blood rate, decreased heart pressure, vomiting, etc. The environmental, the environmental Protection Agency considers three milligrams, three milligrams per liter in groundwater as an indicator of contamination above uh, occur naturally occurring levels, and the legal limit for nitrate in drinking water is 10 milligrams per liter. However, most recent studies have shown strong evidence of increased risks of colorectal cancer, thyroid disease, and neural tube birth defects at levels of 5 milligrams per liter or even lower. Data obtained from under public records sh laws shows that between 2003 and 2017, tests detected elevated levels of nitrates um, in the tap water supplies of more than 4,000 communities at least once in those 15 years. The problem we face is that most of these communities have self-supplied drinking water systems that are not federally regulated. And in total, these water supply systems supply tap water for over 45 million Americans. And every year it keeps getting worse especially in the states of California, Kansas, and Texas. Most people in rural communities that have nitrate-contaminated groundwater have no data on their water safety. Since they have no data on their water safety, uh, it is each person's responsibility to test and treat their own well for nitrates and other pollutants. However, many times people don't have the education or means to do this, which increases their risk of being intoxicated with nitrates and being vulnerable to the health problems previously mentioned. So into the technical aspect, what is a biosensor? A biosensor in its simplest terms is a device that uses a biological and physiochemical detector to detect the presence of a certain chemical. The biological component is a reaction that sends out a signal, for example, an enzyme that links to nitrate. And the physiochemical component is the actual use of that chemical, for example, the release of a pink dye. In the presence of a chemical that it's supposed to detect, the biosensor will use at least two reactions to send a signal out to show the presence of that chemical. So, how does our product work? Our testing kit is based on hydrogel beads soaked in an enzymatic solution to detect nitrates in your tap water. The agar nanoparticles will protect the biosensor enzymes and prolong their longevity and reliability. Our pink dye will show the concentration of nitrates in your water. The more brilliant, vibrant pink there is in your beads, the more concentration of nitrate and vice versa. Um, so in order to test the viability of our product, we decided to uh, see whether or not a few different um, types of gels were to degrade in a high nitrate con uh, in a high nitrate solution. Uh, and in order to do that, we created both an agar gel and a carrageenan gel, and then uh, soaked each gel in um, a high concentration nitrate solution uh, for 30 minutes. And after those 30 minutes were up, uh, we determined that um, both the agar and the carrageenan actually did not degrade at all, which is a big success, as it means that um, uh, we can create our beads and they will be able to withstand the harsh conditions of a possibly high concentration nitrate solution. So our product comes in a cardboard box and it includes uh, instructions on how to use our product as well as a pair of gloves to prevent against any skin irritation that come with handling the chemicals. And it also includes a solution bottle with some pre-soaked beads. And uh, they have a shelf life of about six months. So if you run out of your beads, then you can simply go to your local store and buy some more refilled. 
and soak them in your bottle again so you can keep reusing the kit. We also included a pair of tweezers to make it easier to extract and drop the beads into your sample. So to use this product, you would just take a bead out of your bottle and drop it into your water sample and then wait for a little to get your final result. So these are some of our market competitors. And as you can see, they all we all test for nitrates in water, but we're the only product with a simple process. The, our competitors all use a complex multi-step process in order for the test to work properly, but for us, you only have one step to do, so there's no chemical experience required. Uh, additionally, we are also uh, priced at below $100, and the other ones can range from above $100 to above $230. You can also keep reusing our kit Whereas for the others, you only have a limited number of tests. So once you run out, you have to buy an entirely new kit again. Um, so we plan to patent in the US and also in the international market. Um, so we plan to trademark our logo. And we also plan to have a utility patent for our beads. Um, so even though we're planning to first sell in the US, um, we're also going to patent internationally so that our, our idea isn't copied overseas. And for the costs, we plan to spend $1 million on product research and development in the first year, and then $1.2 million on um, to, put it to put our product in the market. And lastly, we plan to spend $1.5 million um, to continue to maintain our product in the market and also to expand. And our total costs would be $3.7 million. And for the future of our company, we plan to have a partnership with one or multiple water filtration companies in the future so that when people find out that they have nitrate in their water, they can then um, find a resolution and get their water filtered by said company. And we also plan to expand um, by creating other products that can detect other contaminants in water, such as arsenic, and also to expand to countries outside of the US. Thank you. Do you have any questions? so that everyone can hear. Okay, so um, one of the big issues is, s um, the, the two issues with sensors is sensitivity and selectivity. And so my question for you is, how selective is your reaction so that it only works for nitrate and not for other things? And will it be sensitive enough to detect these three and five PPM levels that you said were sort of the relevant numbers for groundwater contamination? Yeah, so um, our biosensor bio currently detects nitrate and nitrite, so both in the same family. Um, with sensitivity, it will detect three to five milligrams per liter. Um, it's more just the issue of detecting nitrate and nitrite and having no interferences with other particles. I think manganese is one that starts messing up our biosensor, but other than just very select chemicals that shouldn't be in your water in the first place, there would be no issue. Isn't nitrite also bad? So isn't it equivalent? Is it? I thought it was fine if you detect both nitrate and nitrite. Yeah, yeah, it, it, they're both fine. It's just, it's not just nitrate. But if you shouldn't drink either of them, it's yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it, it poses no problem to talk <laughs> about. Okay, other questions? See, this is what happens when you have a little time to think. 
Thank you, and great presentation. And it seems like you're really focused on the nitrites, but what about having something a little more broad spectrum? Uh, and I think that was kind of the previous type of question. Why did you not consider anything that could test for multiple chemicals and lead, copper, zinc, and you know what else? Yeah, so um, it was less an issue of thinking about these than just the time span that we had. We had about one day of experimenting, and <laughs> our solution needed a lot of very specific chemicals. So expanding with an already pretty difficult solution was kind of out of the out of the question here, but like Sophia said, we would want to be expanding in third year or first year, doing more research about how we can start expanding our brain. Uh, it's basically because uh, how it works is you have this specific reaction and it only works if you have a specific substance and that way the dye will come out. But um, so if you want to, if we want to expand and be able to de detect more, we'd have to d develop uh, more chemical equations, and we just didn't have the time to do that. How do you reuse it? You guys said something about reusability. So basically, uh, once you use up all your beads, you would just buy another package of beads in the store. And since our original box comes with like the bottle of solution that you can use to soak them in, you just put your new beads in the bottle again and keep reusing it that way. It's kind of the idea of recycling all the waste. Well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my wife had the question since she controls the finances in the family. <laughs> how, uh, how, w what would you use to initiate funding for this project? Where would you get funding resources? Um, well, we're planning to get investors um, to like invest in our company, um, um, and possibly, um, or we could possibly be like bought by like a water filtration company, so that like they can use our idea to detect the nitrate and then they can use their filtration uh, t to, f to filter the water. All right, next group, Silkskin. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, before we begin, we have a short advertisement we've prepared for you guys. I've always struggled to take care of my skin, chasing product after product, until I found Filtrue. It gave me my confidence. Raise your hands if you can relate to the model in this video. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are the fabulous co-founders of Silk Skin, and we are, help <laughs> we are here to help. <laughs> we are here to help you tap out of bad skin. I'm Jackson. I'm Nikita. I'm Sothbeck. I'm Kexton, and I'm Kate. All right. So, have you ever experienced anything like premature aging, such as hair loss, hair graying, or wrinkles? Are clogged pores a thing to worry about? Are inflammations or breakouts a common occurrence? 
If you said yes to any of the following questions, then you may be an unsuspecting victim of hard water. So the problem with tap water is that its average pH is too high, with the average um, of tap water being 6.5 to 8.5. It also can contain minerals and chemicals such as magnesium and calcium, which make the water hard. So the essence of our filter is to get rid of these minerals that can damage sensitive skin. According to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, one in three Americans suffer from skin conditions uh, once in their lifetime. Visits to dermatologists can cost from $90 to $275 per counseling session. And treatments like lasers and facials can range from $250 to $2,500 depending on the severity of your skin problem. So our solution to this problem is Filchu, the world's first water filter designed for skin care. So our um, water filter uses nanoscience to make it one of the most effective filters out there on the market. So this, is, this image shows a sample prototype and it has three different layers to it. So the first layer consists of activated carbon nanoparticles. So these nanoparticles will bind to organic chemicals in the tap water and prevent them from going through the filter. Then we have a second layer of zeolite nanoparticles. So these will bind to metal ions, and so these will filter out the calcium and magnesium that are bad for your skin. And then we're going to have a third membrane, which will infuse this now softened water with facial nutrients that are good for your skin. So here's a cross section of filter. So top water will go through the filter, and then out will come this new softened and enhanced water. So the current leading competitors of household water filtration are Brita and Pure. But Filtru is different as it is exclusively meant for skin care and it is fused with skin products. Additionally, it is easily attachable and detachable. It has a, its portable size allow it to be used for travel. It also saves you time in your skin care routine by allowing you to flush your face with water and also apply skin nutrients, which you can personalize. So you can, um, <laughs> you can apply a, an array of different products through our nourishing pads, such as hyaluronic acid, which are commonly found in eye drops and moisturizers, in addition to retinol, which is used for anti-aging, lactic acid for damaged skin, kojic acid for pigmentation, and azelaic acid for acne. On the image on the right, we have a small vial containing a small sample of what the water is actually going to look like when it's done filtering. As you can see, it is perfectly clear, so it doesn't feel like you're applying anything foreign onto your skin. But does it actually work? The answer is yes. While tap water has magnesium and calcium in it, our water doesn't. We tested this by adding a phosphate-containing compound into both waters. With our calibration curve, we noticed that um, when magnesium and calcium interact with phosphate, the water turns really cloudy. And you can see it even better in these photos, where the tap water is really cloudy whereas our water is um, perfectly clear. This means that tap water is hard because it contains magnesium and calcium, whilst our water is soft and doesn't contain those harmful minerals. But does it actually infuse with the, with, the, um, with the nutrients for your skin? That's also yes. We decided, to infu we decided to infuse our water with hyaluronic acid, and this is really safe for your skin. If it gets in your eye, that's no problem either because hyaluronic acid is often found in eye drops. We expected the water to um, have a pH of around 5 afterwards, because that's the ideal pH. We found that for both tap water and filtry water, it both goes down to 5. But the difference between filtry water and tap water is the concentrations of magnesium and calcium. Filtry water does not have magnesium and calcium, while its tap water does. We plan to protect our product with two patents. One is for the landmark design of the plastic container, and one is for the process of filtering then infusing. We also plan on having a trademark on the name Silk Skin and Filtru itself. So on to our market analysis. The graph provided by Grandview Research uh, displays the growth of the U.S. cosmetic market from 2015 to 2025. The dark purple at the bottom represents the skincare market. Skincare is growing rapidly in popularity as the years progress, suggesting more people are interested in a product like ours. And since we are a two-in-one product, we also 
uh, want to focus on the water filtration market. Uh, the water purifier market was valued $36.02 billion in 2020 and is predicted to reach $107.25 billion in, 20, in 2030. Alicia Van Test surveyed 520 women on where they seek information about beauty products before purchasing them. 67% say that they turn to social media influencers for information on cosmetic products. That is why Silk Skin wants to collaborate with influencers from beauty YouTubers to makeup brand owners uh, to promote our product to our potential target audience. Next, we'll be moving on to a timeline of the next three years. So in year one, we plan to develop and produce our product um, still true filters as well as nourishing pads, and this will cost us around $1.2 million. In year two, we plan to officially la launch Silkskin's Fill True Filter to the market, as well as tabulate our consumer data based on our marketing trends, and this will cost us around $1.5 million. Finally, in year three, we plan to grow and expand our product, our product and our production facilities and take steps towards an international market, costing us to, uh, to around $2 million. Finally, we move on to the key metrics of around three years, or two years after our initial launch. So first, the overall production cost will be around $4.7 million. And we plan to spend around $2.3 million on advertisement. Um, because of these, our revenue will be around $21 million due to the large market that is the beauty industry. This will make, us our, this will make our net profit around $14 million and with a gross profit margin of around 67%. Uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? guys this is a really interesting idea um, so it seems like what really makes your product unique and stand out from your other water filtration competitors is that uh, nutrient filled membrane I'm wondering if you have some sort of idea of the um, lifetime of those like how much water can flow through your filter before those nutrients run out oh yes so we're still um, testing the different membrane uh, capacities but we're planning on selling a package of uh, different types of membranes in addition to the replacement filter, which can be bought between a week and a month depending on the usage. But the, uh, the plastic encasing is permanent. Okay, so uh, you mentioned, uh, I think of a, a profits uh, number at like 21 million. Um, how did you arrive at that number? So like what what percentage of the market are do you think you're going to capture at different points in your trajectory? And why why do you estimate that? Okay, so for the first year, since we're still in development, we don't plan on actually making profit for the first year, and we plan to actually start bringing in profit around the sec or middle of the second year, due to the first year being in development, and we still have we're probably going to have negative profit in the first year because we have to invest into making our product better but because the beauty industry is so big and we've done research from like and we've seen statistics from Statista that um, show that the beauty market is really large right now and it's growing and it's one of the largest in the US right now so um, we plan on just making at least like one fourth or of the people who use like daily beauty products yeah one yeah one fourth of the of the population, sorry. At, that <laughs> what, at what point? At around three years and beyond. That's, that's pretty optimistic. Yeah, <laughs> my, my guess is that well, it's very is high, <laughs> but um, but nobody makes 67% profit in the third year. So <laughs> it's okay. It doesn't have to be that high. Okay. Um, I, my little baby company is like, I don't know, four years old. We haven't made a penny yet, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> That you, that you, it's harder than you think, I think, is the answer to actually turn a baby company into something that makes profit. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have a question for you. 
And then parents, get ready. We have to have at least one parent question. Um, okay, so you have all these cool things that you can put in the water. You probably don't want to like brush your teeth with those. And so I think the key thing of this technology is it's got to be easy on, easy off. So that you just put it on when you're washing your face and you feel like I'm putting great stuff on my face and then I take it off for other times. Every sink under the sun is different. What are your thoughts for creating something that can fit on to the 50,000 different kinds of cool sink fixtures that all of the rich people have in their designer bathrooms? <laughs> okay, so our product is actually um, made to be easily detachable and retachable. And it's also versatile for all types of sink types because the top, um, we're hoping to have some sort of rubber that can bend and stick onto different types of, of sinks. But there's a force pushing it down as the water comes through. Mm -hmm. So there has to be something holding it up. So like in addition to the rubber, there could be like a clasp thing that you could like tighten once like the rubber is on to secure to safely secure it so, so that when the water like runs, it doesn't like fall off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, my point is mostly to point out, you got a great idea. Now there's like a very practical engineering challenge yeah. to make this something that people could actually purchase. Yeah. Um, and that's the way it always is. You have a great idea and then like, oh my God, I actually have to engineer something that will really work. And I think that's where this this is, which is not a bad place to be. Okay, parents, one parent question, yay. Thank you for the the um, the product that I'm actually very interested in mm -hmm. um, <laughs> once it's it's on the market. Um, so you have it sounds like you have two components to your to your idea. You have the filter as well as the pad. Now, do you do a, as a consumer? Do I need to purchase the pads in order to 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 maximize the benefit of the filter? And is there a science to all of that? Um, so the pads are actually optional. You don't have to have them in. They're not related to the filter. The filter just filters things out. The pad puts things in. So if you don't want something in, you don't have to do it. Beautiful, thank you. Locks. Come on up. Yeah. Which one are you guys? Hi everyone, I'm Rose. I'm Kevin. I'm Luca. I'm Maya. And I'm Tara. And I'm Will. And we are Ferrolux. We use ferrofluids, a unique kind of nanostructured fluid that's magnetic to make our lock almost unpickable. So our problem is that current locks on the market are not reliable. Current locks that most homes have are electronic or generical physical locks. Even with these locks as a main line of defense for homes, there are still two and a half million annual burglaries, according to the United States Department of Justice. Here, I've put together a, a short compilation of clips of people demonstrating how easy it is to pick locks from YouTube. <laughs> So uh, now that we have seen these demonstrations, one thing needs to be kept in mind. So the thing is that with these clips, people weren't using some sort of high-tech equipment to render these locks useless. 
The clips you just watched included people picking locks with paper clips, standard lock picking tools, and even a pink princess electric toothbrush. And now moving on to our product, the Ferrolock. The Ferrolock is a ferrofluid based home lock with an elegant internal design. It is unpowered and most importantly, it is unpickable. Um, it also comes with a key with magnetic teeth, similar to a regular house key. And the teeth at the end are specific to the amount of ferrofluid within our structure. So ferrofluids, what are ferrofluids? Well, ferrofluids are a fluid that becomes magnetized in the presence of an outside magnetic field. Um, they are synthesized by suspending super paramagnetic nanoparticles in a fluid. Okay, so why ferrofluids? By now you might be saying, okay, why don't you just have like a uh, bar of iron, for example, anything that responds to a magnet normally, because our product pretty much relies on a levering system. Well, actually it turns out that without a very, very complicated key mechanism, if you just wanna have something that functions like, I don't know, uh, turning a key perhaps instead of moving your feet five feet to the left, um, you need to have something with two components in it. We need a fluid behavior within a cylinder so we can slowly shift the center of mass, um, tipping our little cantilever, and that just doesn't occur uh, with solid ferromagnets. Additionally, we can precisely calibrate the volume of ferrofluids that we use in each cylinder relative to its magnet's key strength. This makes it very difficult to pick. Um, and it's a reasonably intuitive locking and unlocking mechanism. Here's a kind of 3D tech demo just to give you a general sense of what you're looking at. Uh, so we can see kind of along here, this is where the hinges would lie. Um, this whole green thing is our door. Uh, the purple is where you put your key in. Uh, on the right, we can see the model where we don't have a door anymore, and you can see the kind of general locking mechanism. Um, and we can just see the simple process of turning it back and forth. You can envision somebody turning a key back and forth. It's just nice and easy. Okay, so this is our proof of concept, and this is our experiment. So for our experiment, we synthesized the ferrofluid and then we put it into the Falcon tube. And um, so basically in this video, you can see me holding the magnet over the right side of the tube and um, all of the ferrofluid comes to that side so it can lock. And then now I put the magnet on the left side and you can see how that ferrofluid comes to that side and now it can unlock and go to the little opening. So our product versus regular pin locks. So our product is has no pins, which makes it unpickable. Um, on the other hand, pin locks have pins, and they're easily picked, as you can see in the videos that we showed earlier. And um, ours has the shape, like it has the shape of a regular key, but it has magnetic keys that are, or magnetic teeth at the bottom that you can use to unlock it. And the pin locks are vulnerable to generic and nonspecific pick kits. And then our product versus electronic locks, ours are operational 24 seven, so it doesn't require power to use, but electronic locks are susceptible to power loss and you can't use them if your phone's dead or if the power goes out. And then our product can't be hacked on, and on the other hand, electronic locks can be hacked. Uh, market analysis. While regular uh, physical pin locks can go from about 50 to $300 with a lifetime approximately seven years, and regular digital locks can go from up to, from 300 up to $1,200, and with a sort of technically unlimited lifetime. Our ferrofluid lock has a lifetime of approximately 20 years, and um, uh, we priced our lock and key at $159.99 with a production cost of approximately $80 with an optional uh, $60 installation fee, although you can be installed with uh, third party um, people like general locksmiths. Uh, we also offer a lock replacement for people who have already bought the lock at $119.99, and uh, the manufacturing price for that is about $70. And uh, we also offer, we as well, we offer off, uh, offer a key replacement at $42.99, uh, costing with a with a cost for us at $20. And we offer a two-year limited warranty that uh, allows, if the lock manuf uh, there's a manufacturing error in the lock, it'll be repla replaced completely for free as well as the key. And uh, why our product is unique. Um, you can actually see the inside of the lock from the inside your house and the inside of the door, so it has a unique aesthetic, which you don't usually see in most locks unless they're bought for demonstration purposes. They have superior security since they can't be hacked or the power can't be turned off like an electronic lock or easily 
picked with a uh, princess toothbrush, like was shown in the video, and uh, we also offer discounts and replacements uh, for any broken parts. Okay, so here is our roadmap for product development. Within the first six months, we want to do our initial research as well as some development. And then within the first year, we want to get out our market studies as well as some refinement. And then we want to start our Series A investment within one and a half years. Then during the second year, we want to expand our manufacturing and we'll finally launch our product, hopefully within two and a half years in the US. And then if it's possible, we want to start expanding it to the international market in the third year. So here's our estimated annual cost for the first three years. As you can see, the third year is a little more because that's when we plan on doing a lot of our expanding, such as going to the international and expanding our manufacturing. And we plan on to start making profit a few years after the th third year. And now here are some even more opportunities for further expansion. Since our locks are inside the door, they're not ugly like some other locks, and they can have an aesthetic design that can be used for luxury displays. They can also have commercial and industrial applications as well, such as vaults, padlock, et cetera, and anything you can think of that requires a lock. They can be used as a backup key for cars. For example, if you lock your keys inside your car, if you forget them somewhere, they can be used as a backup. And for protecting our product, we plan on patenting uh, two things, the interior mechanism of the lock and the overall system of how it works. And we also plan to patent in the US. Um, that concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Okay, I normally wouldn't be the one to ask a business question, but uh, isn't like making twice as much as you spend on the locks like somewhat ambitious? Uh, not particularly, considering we're charging significantly less than normal pin locks do, and like ridiculously large amounts less than any average digital lock. And I mean that average markup is is relatively common. I mean the the thing it will the amount of money it will cost to make a standard like master lock couldn't isn't going to be much more than thirty or forty bucks, and they they can cost upwards of, as they say like three hundred dollars. So it's not exactly an insane markup. The lock industry is kind of a monopoly shared between a few different companies and they set the prices as they wish. It's almost like jewelry. Okay, so yeah, I just had a quick question would um about like how your like security system would work. Like normally in like generic locks the pins differentiate and make each lock unique so that like some random person's key couldn't open your key or, or your lock, sorry. But then in this mechanism wouldn't all locks be sort of like similar so that someone else's key could just open your lock or am I mistaken for something? So the key does like come in different Okay, there we go. Um, in Vision, you have kind of the key goes in, uh, and it's able to slide in only if it's the right key. And then additionally, you can envision a sort of internal circle that the key wants to turn on. However, there's going to be kind of tracks on the inside, so the key's teeth must actually fit along those, or it can't be turned at all. So when we did the Fairfoot lab, we were told the magnets we used for the lab to not put it near any phones or electronic devices because it could mess up the device. So how would you solve for that? Because people will be carrying their keys around with them in their pockets, right? So with the keys in your pocket, we plan on making like kind of like a cap for them for the magnetic part that you can easily, it'll be attached to the actual key. So you can just take it off when you need to insert the key and then put it back on when you need to pocket. And it'll protect it from like all the, mag uh, like all the things that could be damaged by magnets. Yeah, that was a really good point. So I, I have to say, I'm not entirely clear on how the, the mechanism works. I, I get the idea that you don't have physical pins you move, that instead you magnetize the ferrofluid 
give it structure and then do something with the magnetized ferrofluid. And there is, that's a whole extra dimension. So you can have a physical pattern and then you also have the pattern of magnetization. I'm not sure I quite see how that, you know, this kind of simple thing would actually translate into the details of a lock. Um, but I do want to just say, ferrofluids are like the coolest things ever, and they were discovered a long time ago. And everybody is really searching for something really good to do with them because they should be really useful, but they're not always. And so um, it's a really interesting idea of how you could take the unique properties and put them into an everyday item. Like I said, I'm still a little confused on the details of how you would do that, but I think the concept is really excellent. And my question is, looking at the diagram, if you're on the inside of the house, how do you unlock it? Um, okay, so we're looking at kind of the front side, but if you can envision from the back side, the actual physical mechanism is visible. So you can physically just move the lever, and it's, it's actually kind of satisfying, to be honest. I'll ask one really quickly. Good job, guys. Um, you said that the lifetime of this lock is about 20 years. I'm just wondering if you could speak more specifically about the factors that you use to arrive at this estimate. Uh, well, that's just simply according to the internet because they have to be suspended in a specific fluid. And uh, like all fluids, over time they do evaporate and eventually the lock will stop working. It, they might work longer, they might work shorter, but Ideally, they work shorter because that's how we're going to be making our money. So, <laughs> Metal on metal stuff is always going to wear out over time. Um, where physical locks have seven-year lifetimes is because the pin structures are just constantly moving. Every time you turn the key, you're taking life off of it. Um, our system still has some mechanical sections, so it will wear out the metal eventually. It's just a little bit slower because we don't have such vulnerable pins. So actually, just one quick comment on the um, evaporation thing. The one, one of the few products that I know that does use ferrofluids is actually a seal between a rotating part which has vacuum on one side and not vacuum on the other. And so, and, and the idea is that magnets keep the liquid in place. There are some very low vapor pressure liquids because they can survive against vacuum. And so I actually think that that part of the problem is solved. You can use things that have effectively no vapor pressure to put them in, so they won't evaporate. They could still leak, but I think the evaporation part is actually a solved piece of this. Okay, awesome job, guys. Yeah, great job. <laughs> all right, good job to all of our first four groups. Uh, so let's all take a nice little break for a little bit. Uh, let's plan. It's about 11.50 right now. Let's plan to be back here and ready to go at 12.05. So I'll give you guys like a three minute warning when we all gotta come back.
Which which one are you guys? Um, Phil Straits and Mason. Right, but where's which your one? ah? Aha, thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for coming today. And we are Filtration Nation, a car wash filtration system, and we invented the product, the Water Filter 01, AKA the WF01. And I'm Claudia. I'm Sahasra. I'm Angelique. I'm Karen. I'm Chihiro. All right. So why the WF01? Our product is a water filtration system installed under car wash drains. Dry states in the United States, such as California, suffer from water wastage and droughts. In the United States, the average car wash washes around 20,000 cars annually, and each car uses around 65 to 80 gallons of fresh water. This wastewater is contaminated with bacteria, oil, soap, dirt, and grease, which can be harmful if released into the environment. Our goal is to create a filter that will filter out oils and possible detergent from the water and allow this water filtered water to be reused and not put down the drain. The market analysis shows that from 2021 to 2028, the car wash industry is estimated to grow around 3.1% annually. In 2020, this industry was worth $35 billion, and by 2028, it is projected to be worth around $44 billion. This shows that the market is growing and leads to many car washes being open to the idea of filtering and saving water. A couple of reasons for the growth are that there are more vehicles per household, and in the past couple of years, car demand has gone up. Customers also prefer washing their cars at a car wash instead of in their household. Studies show that 72% of people that have cars prefer getting them washed at car washes and not in their home. This wa the WF01 doesn't have much competitors, but one that was similar is the HydroClean. We differ from the HydroClean because we are underground and convenient, which makes us hidden. We reuse and recycle 100% of our water. We are cheaper, cheaper and we have removable filters which are easy to replace. The HydroClean, on the other hand, is above ground and takes up space. It is expensive and high maintenance. By using our product, car wash companies can reduce the, their water bill as well as reduce the amount of water they waste. Our filter will be able to clean out the contaminants and dirt in the car wash water and produce clean water that can be used again in future car washes. Our product is also cheaper and more convenient than our competitors as we offer services to replace the filters for a small cost. This product is catered towards car washes in California and other places in the Southwest that are suffering from drought. The car wash will have two or three drains on either side which the dirty wa wastewater will flow into. This depends on the size of the car wash. From there, the water will flow into pipes underneath and then it will pass through our filter. The water will then flow into the water tank, which it will be stored in, and 100% of the water will be reused. The first layer of our filter is the layer of sand, which works to remove large contaminants and oil and grease. This is followed by the zeolite layer, which removes heavy metals. After that is a layer of activated charcoal, which removes contaminants at the nanoscale, and lastly, three membrane filters. Then the water will flow into a water tank, which it will be stored in until it needs to be reused. One thing that makes our filters different from others is that each of our layers are separate and removable. This makes it extremely easy to take out and replace when the layers are too dirty to filter out any more water. Okay, so here are the effects of each material. Activated charcoal can remove oil because organic chemicals can attach to the nanostructure of the charcoal. Membrane filter has pores small enough to filter out activated charcoal or bacteria at a nanoscale. Sand can also remove oil and zeolite can break down and detoxify the heavy metals because the cations of the metals replace the sodium ion. So for our product, we perform two experiments. We prepare this matcha-like solution, which represents our car wash wastewater. It had water, olive oil, detergent, dirt, and copper sulfate. We filtered the solution with our model and we were able to obtain this clear solution with bubbles. So we were able to remove the 
unwanted materials like dirt, oil, and copper sulfate, but recycle water and detergent. This makes our product unique because instead of just recycling water, we can also recycle some detergent. So in experiment two, as this graph shows, one eighth teaspoon of charcoal removed 2.5 milliliter of oil completely. From this, we found out that for every liter of oil, we need at least 250 milliliter of activated carbon to completely filter it out. So this is our timeline. And for the first year, we are looking at about $1.7 million. And the majority of this will go towards product testing and development and also experimentation. Our second year, we are looking at about $2 million. And by this time, we are hoping to have a finalized product. And then we will begin manufacturing and advertising to car washes in California. And finally, in our third year, we are looking at about $2.6 million. And we are looking to expand to other states and possibly create a WF 2.0. Um, also, this is a financial breakdown of the cost. Our one-time purchases include computers, software, lab furniture, and lab equipment. And our annual costs for each year include marketing and shipping. And finally, our raw materials for each year, starting at the first year, is about $16,000, second year $21,000, and finally third year $25,000. And this is our product price breakdown. Each filter unit will cost $2,750. There will be a $750 installation fee, and this covers like all numbers of filters you can buy for car washes. And finally, each year there is a $1,000 service check where, you, where we replace the filters every two months. Uh, we plan on getting a utility patent on the layers in our filter as we, as we can easily take them out and replace them individually. We plan on getting a patent only in the United States and for now. And um, we'll also get a trademark on our company logo, which is Filtration Nation. And this trademark will fall under the suggestive trademark category. In the future, we can use sodium hydroxide to increase the surface area of the n activated charcoal on the nanoscale. And this will allow the activated charcoal to hold more contaminants, and we will not have to change the filter as often, which will in turn reduce the cost. If the system is successful, we plan on extending to other states and areas with or without drought. And don't forget, save the planet one car wash at a time. Filtration Nation thanks you. Thank you, guys. Okay, so your science is pretty sound. I think that the base ideas will work. My question is, how are you gonna install this for $750 when it involves stuff under the ground? So the, I, the issue is that the, in, the building into floor drains is really the convenient way to do it, but that's a huge actual building cost. So can you comment on how this is going to be practically installed in various businesses. <laughs> OK, so basically, I think this is a really great question. Thank you very much. Um, this is, since in our like timeline, we talked about how the first year is about like experimentation and like product development. So I kind of think that the engineering aspect of actually putting this underneath car washes will fall into that category and um, we'll probably come up with a solution in a year. So ask us that question then. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's likely that, that some car washes will be much easier to do this. Uh, a lot of them are actually built on slab on the ground. Car washes are sort of low tech. And so there may be a fairly easy way to just you know, break into the concrete slab, dig it in, and then replace the concrete slab. But I think the installation costs are way, way low because you are going to have to like break floors, and that is is very expensive to replace. Okay, parent question. So it looks like the detergent or the soap is still in the water. So is there any point to how this is going to work with all that? 
Okay, so we we only need to get out the toxic materials. Um, and so the soap is okay because we're going to reuse the water anyways for the car wash. So having the soap in it already just saves money on detergent. Great job, guys. Um, so for having the filters underground, um, you need to get the water back up, right? So this will require you to pump some water from underground. So moving water requires a lot of energy. So I'm wondering if you thought about how that extra energy that you'll need to use for that is going to like compare to the water that you're going to save through the process. Um, well, we haven't really thought about that, but I guess we could do um, solar power um, panels. So it will basically power itself. The uh, remaining soap residue, is it uh, presumably micellar and is it complexed with oils and do you then run a lifetime limit to how much you can reuse your water? Okay, um, so, f so for the soap with detergent, so each car uses soap to wash their car and in the end of the car wash there'll be like a re-rinse with a little bit of fresh water to get all the remaining soap off. Pharaoh fighters. Observe. Okay, <laughs> which one is this one? I'm assuming. Hello everyone, thank you so much for being here. My name is Abigail. I'm Pauline. I'm Irina. I'm Raj. I'm Boris. I'm Gabriella. Um, together, we are Pharaoh Fighters. And today we'd like to introduce you to the Spion Breast Cancer Treatment, a super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticle fluid injection. So as the Pharaoh Fighters, our mission is to advance research in cancer treatment in hopes to improve cancer survival and ameliorate the already difficult situation of battling cancer by providing better treatment options. As a newly founded company, we'd like to start with breast cancer. As the tumors for breast cancer are located considerably more far away from vital organs such as the heart, and also because the tumors are mostly localized within a specific area, and unlike leukemia, which runs through the blood cells and tissues. So right now, the problem with cancer is that cancer treatments are often very harmful. Current treatments such as immunotherapy, radiation, and primarily chemotherapy damage healthy cells. This leads to a variety of side effects. This is a pie chart um, c that collected data from breast cancer patients who went through treatment. And as we can see, such side effects include fatigue, anxiety and depression, numbness, lymphedema, hair loss, weight change, and et cetera. Now to undergo all of this, this difficult treatment and the painful side effects, not only for the patient themselves, but also for their loved ones to watch, why do, why do cancer patients still choose to go through these treatments? Well, that's because there are, no, there are not many other better solutions, which is why we're proposing the Spion injection, a super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticle fluid injection, which is based off the concept of ferrofluids and the nanoparticles. So the future of cancer treatment has the potential to lie within the nanoparticles due to its ultrafine size, um, ability to go through biological barriers, the surface relativity, and tunable properties. Now at this time, we'd also like to say that our goal is to uh, take the first step in, in research so that this 
may have the potential to work to its fullest on everyone, but in a different way. Um, so the basis of our product is an innovation of nanoscience called ferrofluid. This material is a fluid composed of synthesized nanoparticles that become magnetized only when an external magnetic field is applied to them. This form of magnetism that occurs at the nanoscale is known as superparamagnetism. Um, so our product Spion, also known as superparamagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, is an intratumoral ferrofluid injection that will be administered by medical professionals into a predetermined area of the human body where a breast cancer tumor is located. The nanoparticles within the ferrofluid will be about 10 nanometers in diameter and will be equipped with antibodies um, that recognize receptors that are only expressed on cancer cells. Then an external magnetic field of about 0.5 teslas will be applied to the ferrofluid, causing it to resonate and heat up, ultimately heat killing the cancer cells that make up the tumor. For reference, um, this magnetic field strength of 0.5 teslas is comparable to that of some MRI scanners, and uh, the magnet used will heat up the ferrofluid to a temperature of 43 degrees Celsius, which is a sufficient temperature to kill the cancer cells. Um, after serving their purpose, the ferrofluid particles um, can either be broken down by macrophages in the liver, or they can be filtered out of the body entirely by the kidneys. The following chart lists several criteria with which we can evaluate our spine and treatment against traditional cancer treatment therapies such as chemotherapy. Chemotherapy and radiation therapy both pose a threat of recurrence even if there are no signs of the tumor after treatment. Similarly, they can also have numerous side effects that can be detrimental to the well-being of the patient. Although there is uncertainty surrounding Spion, as it has not been heavily researched, there are multiple scientific articles suggesting that Spion may have the potential to completely remove a cancerous tumor with minimal to no health effect on the patient, making it a promising treatment to pursue. In animal studies, as well as phase one and two trials in humans, similar magnetic nanoparticle solutions have killed tumors in types of cancer that are extremely difficult to treat, with only minor side effects. The skin next to the tumor is often heated, but for the majority of magnetic nanoparticles, they are often non-toxic or have low toxicity. With the use of citric acid and chemicals with a neutral pH, we are able to maximize compatibility with the human body. For our proof of concept experiment, what we did is we synthesized a ferrofluid that is soluble in water by uh, using citric acid to cap the nanoparticles, uh, which prevents the uh, iron oxide from uh, degrading. And they're uh, water soluble, which means that they can be stored safely because it's non-toxic and won't evaporate, at least not quickly. Um, and those are two different ferrofluids that were made, um, one of the with two different synthesis methods. So they ended up with different thicknesses, but both of them are water soluble and uh, can be moved around with the magnet, as shown there, and would be able to be heated with a strong enough magnet. Um, but how is our product getting inside the market? So we're willing to have a 12 years path that will be funded by investors who choose to support our company. So we're using the this capital to provide materials, facilities, and our lab space. On the first three years, we're focusing on researching, experimenting on animals, and gathering information. And on the following six years, with all the tests and information acquired, our company is going to start developing a technology that could be applied in human beings as well as focusing on our intellectual property and FDA approval that could last eight or more years. So to make possible our official launch, we need three more years to release it through a pharmaceutical fellowship and create a partnership with a bigger company. And for our market analysis, uh, we modeled uh, three, our three-year costs being the costs of year one, five, five, hundred million dollars um, for year two five hundred and fifty hundred million dollars and year three about one billion um, 
The cost will include raw materials, equipment, employees, rental space, U.S. patent, clinical and clinical trials. And among the employees, we'll have a COO and being most of them researchers. Um, the high cost of the third year is due to the clinical trials that cost a lot of money. For our intellectual property, we decided to file for a U.S. patent, and specifically, we will be patenting the treatments process. We will also trademark our logo and company name, Pharaoh Fighters. So in the future, we hope to target and kill the cancer cells instead of simply localizing um, the treatment in the tumor site. We will also um, focus on um, the more aggressive cancer types, such as kidney cancer, colon, um, and liver cancer. We will also um, hope to develop nanoparticle-based drug delivery systems, and so the nanoparticles will be loaded with drugs, um, and then they will be engineered to attach to the cancer cells. Um, we'd like to say again that our mission is to take the first step in advancing research in cancer treatment in hopes of improving cancer survival rate and ameliorating the already difficult situation of battling cancer by providing better treatment options. And we took the first step today by presenting to you Spion, our breast cancer treatment. Should you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and contact us. Thank you. Um, is there any specific reason why you guys chose breast cancer rather than any other form of cancer? Um, yeah, we mentioned it. We mentioned it at the start of the presentation. We went with breast cancer because the tumors are normally specified within a, within a specific area, which is breast, and then they aren't located near the vital organs. Like, for example, a cardiosarcoma, the tumor is located directly into the heart, and in injecting our injection a um, feral fluid injecting right into there probably isn't the best idea. But we believe that starting with breast cancer, we can further expand as, as we conduct more research. Another question about your fluid. So if you inject it into the, uh, into the tissue, how do you prevent it from migrating? How do you keep it localized? Um, we have, um, there are, we're, we're gonna have antigens with, it, with the nanoparticles that are equipped to um, bind to certain um, certain proteins that only cancer cells produce. In okay. addition, it is like water-based, so it's not like the biggest issue if it does get into the bloodstream, and then it'll just be uh, excreted. Um, so I, I have actually a, a question to your question and then my real question, which is um, if how much does it need to be diluted before the temperature rise is not significant? Sorry, could you repeat that? So, so you're, you're using these to locally heat at the cancer site. And so you said it doesn't really hurt if it gets into the bloodstream, but if you're then doing this, this magnetic field treatment, they will generate heat. But if they're very dilute, they won't generate so much heat. So the question is, if how much do they need to get diluted as they float away from the cancer site before the temperature rise is small enough in non-cancerous parts of the body that it doesn't do damage? Um, I think that's a question that can be answered with further research um, because I think um, we need to conduct more experiments regarding the actual like, um, spe like specifics regarding the heating. Like um, from scientific literature, we know that it's possible, but um, Again, like you said, we don't know how much to dilute it, but we know that with research we can find that answer. Okay. All right, so my, r my main question is, um, this idea that you can take fluctuating magnetic particles and apply actually an oscillating magnetic field and basically flip their spins around and make them get hot is in the literature. So how are you going to protect your product 
given um, what the patent literature calls things that are obvious to one that is knowledgeable in the field, which is always what the patent examiners say. So what is going to be unique about your product compared to, I mean, everything builds on what's already known. So I'm not saying you've done something wrong. This is always the challenge of a patent. Um, what, what are the things that you think you can use to make your product um, patentable? Um, I think the main things would be probably the composition of the ferrofluid, like the injection, along with like the administering or whatever process we use to do that with the medical professionals. So probably those could be license or patent to protect our company. Um, composition of matter patents are always the best ones. So you want to base your patent around the, the stuff itself because methods patents are super easy to get around. I mean, the unfortunate thing with this is that, like, magnetite nanoparticles already do exist. And so that's not, like, our own innovation that could really be patented. So we'd have to try and work with the patents that we could have. Th there's, but the stuff on the outside and the targeting and the composition of what you inject, those are all, comp those are all parts of composition of matter. So there are plenty of things that, that can be patented. So we probably have time for one more question. Oh, you got one. Good. Um, because ferromagnets can interact with other technologies, how do you plan to prevent your injection from um, interacting with, let's say, a pacemaker? Um, I think that that has to be further research, but a patient's condition has to be fully assessed to determine whether this is really the best choice. Because we are presenting this as a better option, but of course, everyone is different. We can't guarantee that this is going to be the best one for every every single person on the planet. Uh, so the costs that you mentioned in years one, two, and three, obviously, like compared to some of the other groups that we've heard are much, much higher. Um, do you, what would be your strategy to actually fundraise for this amount of money? And do you anticipate um, keeping your innovation within your company or do you anticipate partnering with, with someone at some point? And if so, who might that be? Um, since we're talking about clinical trials, there's no much we can do to minimize the, co the cost because it's something really expensive. And as I said, we're looking to um, build a partnership with a bigger company so um, the company could provide support for us, even though um, we have our own company. But if we have the partnership with another one, materials, um, lab space, and all the substance we're going to need to provide our, our investments will be much more easier because we'll have partnership with a bigger company. So just to follow up with that, so what kind of company would you want to partner with? I mean, I'm assuming like probably another pharmaceutical or biotech company that could acquire us and like, you know, hopefully provide us, as she said before, with those same lab spaces and researchers or whatever materials are needed. Got it. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say, I, I just think that the coolest thing about this whole program is that there are products that are inspired by, it totally inspired by tech, and then there are other products that are totally inspired by brilliant ideas, like, um, you know, clean faces that everybody that everybody needs, but it's not, it, it, it's more the finding the market niche versus finding the tech that will make it work. And that, that dichotomy is really the cool thing about market development. There's all sorts of ways to do it. So thank you guys. Nice job. All right. Uh, do works. This, uh, which one is it? This, this one? Final presentation, please. This yeah. one. Yeah. <coughs> 
<clears throat> so hello, ladies and gentlemen. Our company name is DoWorks, a company co-founded by me, Alexander. I'm Aiden. I'm Sophia. I'm Max. I'm Roshni. And I'm Nita. And our product name is called Iridu, which is a unique product that, rec that uses nanotechnology to recollect otherwise lost excess water. Um, the composition of it is much easier than like the method that you make it. Um, so yeah, that's what we plan on patenting. So actually, the, the, the method is easier to patent than the composition. It's just worse less, because it's easier to get around methods patents, because there's usually a lot of ways to do the same thing. Um, but just to point out, it's, you know, all the pieces are known. You can't patent the pieces as, as a new thing. It's their combination working together that is the, the patentable idea. So it has to have all the details together and their function to make it something. A every piece you're putting in is well established. It's just the way you're putting it together. Okay, other questions? Yes, don't get tired yet. We got, we got just one more after this. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just, I missed the first couple of seconds, so I'm, I really apologize if I missed this, but I wondered if you had thought about what application you would use this in. So is this sort of an agricultural product? Um, and if so, how do you foresee, like, in its application, the cost of installing something like this one by one? Or could it be grouped together um, for a kind of ease of installation? Uh, yeah, so for, in oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm short. Uh, for installing them, it's a pretty in simple installation. You just shove it into the ground. It's nothing like you had to drill, unless you have like really hard soil for some reason. But other than that, you can just kind of push it in. So in that way, farmers, um, they can like push it, like as they're like putting in seeds or something, they could also have, um, you can develop a machine for this, but it's still pretty simple to do it by hand. So as they're like, planting each seed, they can put something in equal intervals. And uh, sorry, I missed the first part of the question. I think it was just what was the main market? Oh yeah, it's for farmers and such because they're getting less water due to the drought. So to be able to help them get enough water to feed their plants and such, it collects water from the atmosphere. Yeah, sorry, just to add on, um, something that makes our product, un our product unique is just the fact that it's like fully autonomous and it doesn't require like solar power or batteries or something like that. So once the farmers put it in the soil, it's pretty much fully able to work on its own um, until it needs to be replaced. So. That's great. Thank you. Okay, we may have time for one more super short question. Um, I'll ask. Uh, Go for it. Go for it. Okay, um, just a quick question. So these are like in the ground. Um, in farms and things like that. I'm wondering how, if you've thought about, you know, the different machines that farmers need to use for picking, a lot of times people are driving tractors and things like that. How um, would these stand up for something like that? Uh, I mean, these are pretty low to the ground. I don't think it's kind of been covered of like the scale of this, but I think we were thinking of like six inches under the ground and three inches above. So kind of three inches above the ground is, is kind of not much compared to a tractor. And also I think they like arrange their fields in such a way where they don't they're not like actively running over crops. So I feel like you could probably like include it in the layout of the farm because like kind of when a vehicle would drive it would crush the like plants and soil under under tread. Yeah. Okay, last question. Adding on to the previous question, what about animals? What about animals? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, what if the animal like destroys it or something, or if some or a dog like digs it up? Um, I think um, with our mechanism having like six inches underneath it, I think it should be pretty durable. Uh, but through further research, we could experiment and see maybe we do need to add some maybe like safety precautions or maybe just make the entire model more safe and secure in the ground. But yeah, through further research and development, we could definitely. Uh, add that to their product. I'm um, kind of adding on to that. When you said animals, um, I'm not sure if we made it super clear, but we are tailoring this product to like farms, like big acre farms. I don't think farmers usually have their animals like running around the farm as far as I know. So I don't think animals would be too much of a problem at all, actually. It's the, un it's the unwanted visitors. The unwanted, <laughs> such as unwanted dogs running around the farm field. Gophers. <laughs> that much is fair.
Yeah. <laughs> if you make it out of metals, the gopher can't eat it. I can tell you, they tried. We've had gophers try to eat everything at our garden, but they can't eat metal. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Let us thank this group. <laughs> you guys did an awesome job. And we have just one more presentation. So let Rita introduce. Yeah, so, so to round off our presentations, we're going to have Team Round. Ha! Hey! Okay, hey everyone, we're Round, which stands for Realistic Outings with Nozzle Detection, and our products are the Safety Stick and the Be Safe Beads. I'm Jaden. I'm Weston. I'm Daniel. I'm Aiden. I'm Maggie. And I'm Alexis. Now, our problem is that when people go out, specifically to bars or clubs, sometimes someone might spike their drink with a drug when they're not paying attention. One in nine women have claimed to be victims of this, and six to 8.5% of US college students have been drugged before. Our solution to this problem is called the safety stick, which is a reusable stick, and it's like a little bit bigger than a tube of chapstick, so it's meant to be like discreet, and it detects these spiking drugs using color-changing beads that we call Be Safe beads. So our safety stick is extremely easy to use, especially if you're under the influence of alcohol or other drinks that you might find in bars or like parties. All you have to do is you put the stick into the drink, you make sure liquid can enter this hole right here, and the liquid will uh, enter the tube stick thing, and it'll go in and make contact with our hydrogel be safe beads and cause it to change color if the drink has been spiked. And then all you have to do is press a button that will be like on the side, of the safety stick to start a mechanism w inside which reads the intensity of the color of the bead. This is the inner layout of our safety stick. Down here we have a check valve, which is a one-way valve that allows the drink to go in but doesn't allow, but prevents possibly toxic materials from coming out. So you can still enjoy your drink if it hasn't been spiked. Down here is our safety bead, or be safe bead uh, placement location. It's secured by a latch so it doesn't move after you've placed it in there. And it has a divider down here that separates part of it from most of the liquid, so the color of the drink doesn't affect the sensor reading made by this LED light and this sensor. The sensor shines a light through the bead, and then the color uh, intensity reading is then read by the sensor and sent to this microcontroller up here, which determines whether or not it needs to send a message to your phone via this Bluetooth transmitter based on the intensity of the color read by the sensor. Everything is lined with inner casing so that none of the liquid touches the electronics and powered by a lithium coin battery and started with a button. If the user does not uh, feel like checking their phone or feel like they can check their phone, the tip down here is transparent so they can just look at the bead and determine if it's changed color or not. And this part is also detachable so when you need to replace a bead after it's been used, it's really easy to do. So how do our be safe beads work? Well, we use the concept of biosensors. This is when the polymer changes color when it detects a certain chemical. So the first chemical we're using is cobalt tetrathiocyanide. So this detects ketamine. So when cobalt, tetra <laughs> cobalt and ketamine react together, it creates a purple complex. So it changes the bead to purple. We also added nanosilica to make the surface nano rough to increase the reactivity of the cobalt. So the second chemicals we used was PCDA, pentacosadionic acid, and PCDA gabapentin. This senses GHB, which is gamma hydroxybutyric acid. So PCDA is a color metric sensing material that when it senses GHB, it turns red. And gabapentin is a material that has a high affinity for GHB so it makes it easier for the PCDA to do its job. We also added PEO, polyethanol glycol, that is a hydrophilic material to make it easier for the GHB to go into the bead. So two experiments are performed to decide on the overall structure and composition of the hydrogel beads. 
The experiment tested if volume and porosity of the hydrogen gel influence the amount of time it takes before a color change occurs. The results of the experiment shows that volume of the hydrogel bees does not influence the reaction speed, but it does increase the saturation of the resulting color, while low porosity leads to faster reactions. The trend line on the first graph shows how increased volume does not affect the speed of the reaction, and the trend line on the second graph shows how decreased porosity leads to increased time of reaction. In the in the second experiment, we produce the hydrogel through the cross-linking of iota carinchae, which is a biopolymer with different percent of calcium ions. And this is the part of how we incorporate nanotechnology. So from the experiments, we have decided that the hydrogel beads will be kept small enough to reduce costs, but also big enough to satisfy the visibility feature. And the hydrogels will be kept with high porosity for fast results. So for the final design, we decided on 0.3% of calcium ions and 1% of iota carrageen with our beads kept at 15 millimeters in diameter. So um, Round has four main competitors, Undercover Colors, Test My Drink, Day After Testing, and Nightcap. And while our price might be slightly more expensive than some of our competitors, the benefits that our product has outweighs the cost, such as the speed in which you can find your results, the reusability that is unique to our product, the simple use, and the fact that it acts as a drug detection device rather than just a preventative measure. Furthermore, for our profit margins, we're going to be selling the stick with 10 beads at $35, which only costs $20 to make, and then refill packs of 10 more beads that cost $8 to make and will be sold for $20. In our company timeline, in our first year, we plan on doing more research and a market study with costs coming to about $1.5 million. The next year, we'll get our initial product on the market for about $2 million in costs. In our final third year, we'll expand the product range for about $2.5 million. This will bring our total costs to about $6 million. So there are three possible ways we can expand this product into the future. The first two are the different designs for the stick and the beads to detect different substances, so like not just drugs. And we can use this in different liquids like blood, urine, and water. And the third one is through our app. So as of right now, our app uh, lets the user know if their drink has been spiked, but we can add different features to contact your emergency contacts, hospitals, and police. So in order to protect our intellectual property, we're hoping to patent both in the US and international the physical design of the stick and the use of these biosensor beads in commercial drug detection. And then additionally, we would like to trademark both our acronym ROUND and the broken pink and blue pill logo that we have. The safety stick recognizes spiked drinks to prevent drug consumption. When expanding, ROUND will identify distinct materials in various liquids. Thank you for listening. We'll now be taking questions. Um, I have a quick question. So for the other products you showed, there's actually one more product called Smart Straws, where it's just a regular straw that does the same thing except it just does it immediately, and it's, you can buy a lot of them in bulk. So what would you guys say makes this better than that? So the reason that Round is better than our competitors is the fact that you're able to reuse our product where with the different sticks and the different tests, you can only use it once and then you have to throw it away. We are able to reuse the stick as many times as you want, and it'll text both your friends and hopefully eventually um, police and other things in addition to using, giving yourself a notification, and yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, no, it looks like a great um, development. Uh, I was wondering, I, I noticed you had a check valve that allows the material to come in to the, to the receptacle. How, it's probably too early, but how sensitive is this? Uh, how much liquid do you need in there? And what if someone, what if the spike is at the top of the drink or the bottom? Is there a way to mix it to make sure you capture it if it is spiked? 
Um, so since our product only has one hole on it, the liquid can only enter the mechanism at all through the check valve. And so there's no way that it could enter anywhere else. And then even if somehow it did have a leak, all of the electronics are cased. And so the only thing that can get any liquid on it would be the bead, which is exactly what you want to have the liquid on anyways. Yeah, I, I was just concerned uh, if you're sampling and you say put it in the top of the drink, uh, only a small amount comes in, but maybe you want to see if there's something spiked at the bottom of the drink. So how much liquid actually goes in there and would you be able to get to part of the drink that was spiked? Um, I believe that in order to have a drink be spiked, um, the drug needs to be fully dissolved in the drink. So it would mostly be evenly distributed. And since our sensor detects the change in color, not sort of the color, so once um, any single form of chemical reaction happened, our sensor will be able to detect a saturation difference and it will be notifying the user. Let me, let me just add, it, it's a real practical problem, but what we chemists have learned with time is don't do any chemical reaction without stirring. So um, I think that manual solution <laughs> is probably what you got to do. Stir your drink before you test your drink. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, over there. Um, so I was wondering if there was like a minimum amount of the drug that needed to be in the drink for like the bead to detect it. Because like what if there was not enough and the bead wasn't able to detect it? Um, I think if it ever contains any form of drug, uh, a chemical reaction will happen. And the minimal detection really depends on the sensitivity of the sensor because it detects the difference. Um, produced after a chemical reaction. Yeah, okay, but so every sensor has a detection limit, so there's always sensitivity and selectivity. That's always an issue with any sensor. So um, I don't know how selective it is, but there's a, there's a sort of basic answer for sensitivity. What sensitivity do you have to build into your device? What, what are you trying to prevent? <laughs> P people getting drugged. So <laughs> there's a minimum amount that if you actually drink it also won't hurt you. So you just have to make a match. The sensitivity to a uh, human and the sensitivity of your device. Uh, yeah, they'll have to be part of our research later on. So we'll get back to you. <laughs> of course, yeah. Please, please, please no. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Please no. Don't tell me this <laughs> happened in my class. Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this or not, but how do you reuse this if it already has the chemical in it? And then the beads are sold in packs of 10 for $8, so it's pretty easy to get them again. Got it. And you can wash the cap and, like, dishwasher. Okay, thanks. Um, I had a question. So your acronym, ROUND, um, how did you come up with that? Was it kind of just, like, on the spot or...? Okay, so originally, before we were thinking of expanding into different detection areas, it was realistic outings with no drugs. And we really liked the acronym and we started making, like we put it on all of our models and stuff. And then we realized that if we wanted to expand into future, keeping it with no drugs might not be the best in case we were testing for like water impurities. And so then we changed it to novel detection because it still is gonna work as a detection device. Uh, and the reason we chose the word round specifically was because we were kind of thinking the opposite of spiking a drink. So the opposite of a spike would be round. <laughs> Uh, 
Hi, great presentation. I really like your product idea, and I think that it's it's definitely a pretty awesome application. So, science question. It sounds like you landed on using iota carrageenan as your biopolymer. Could you comment a little bit maybe about that molecule and its stability maybe with the types of environments you will be doing your sensing in? Um, so we haven't we haven't been able to do a lot of experiments surrounding um, the environment for the hydrogel, but um, we're guessing high temperature might lead to the gel being deformed, but it would still carry the chemical and the ASA that is needed for the drug detection. Are there any other biopolymers that you worked with over or tested out? Um, we only tested out iota carrageenan with different percent of calcium ions because it uh, directly relates to the porosity of the gels. Okay, so yeah, that would just be something to think about is a lot of like soft drinks or other things that people ingest have like actually pretty different pH values. So maybe that would be an issue, maybe it would not be. And thinking about what ions and things are present some uh, juices, pineapple juice maybe, you know, is that a problem or is it not? Just something to think about. Um, yeah, so f in the solution, we actually added um, a form of buffer that could neutralize the pH. So um, any enzymes in the assay would not be affected, but we're not really sure on the hydrogel. There's one other compound you need to sort of worry about. Because what are you testing? Yeah, what what what's the key other compound other than water and pH you need to worry about? Alcohol. Alcohol. Yeah, sometimes things dissolve in that, so that's probably a good thing to figure out if you're trying to test alcoholic drinks. Okay, uh, do we have time for one more question? Who wants to be the last voice of these presentations? Is that too much pressure? Okay, Jaylene. Okay, so fundamental to this product is a colorimetric assay to determine whether you have drugs in there or not. However, a lot of alcoholic beverages are colored. So do you believe that uh, this might affect um, your sensing? Um, as Aiden pointed out earlier, there is like the little uh, part partition there, so it would only like not it, the color of the drink wouldn't affect the bead directly. It would just be whatever chemical reaction would be caused by the drug. So the bead does not take up colored molecules? Uh, it, that's not what we were able to test yet in the lab, but theoretically it wouldn't be able to take up the colored molecules because it, nothing would uh, react with it. The bead shouldn't like, absorb enough uh, of the drink that there'll be like enough, like a noticeable color change. Yeah because there's like already like assay in the bead. So I don't think it'll absorb enough that the bead will actually like change color. Okay, I am very sorry that this has to be a product that our society would like to have, um, but I think you guys did an awesome job with this product. So, um, Let's thank this group. Um, and I, I, uh, I, I want to just first thank all of these groups. This was a really awesome set of presentations. You guys have all dived into both the science and the business and just the creative process of saying, where is there a market need and where is there technology? Uh, and that's a super challenging thing to do. And I, I've seen a lot of various presentations like this, and I can say this was a really excellent set of presentations. So congratulations to everybody here. Yeah, and I will and I will add to that, and I and I think speak on behalf of the instructors and uh, on behalf of Shailene when I say that we're all very happy with the changes that you also made between yesterday afternoon and today. 
We were definitely hard on you guys yesterday, but this is why we were we were harder on you because we knew that you guys could do really amazing presentations and you did. So really, really good job. We're very impressed with all of you. Great work. And then I also want to, and maybe this is what Professor Tolbert was gonna say, but I also want us to all take one more moment to thank all of our instructors for the very, very large amount of work they put into making this program really, really great. I also want to, uh, you know, say again, thank you to the instructors, and just point out, um, your instructors are all graduate students in the sciences, and so if that's a future you're thinking of, if remember to ask them a million questions. And then I do want to end. Um, uh, Rita has thanked a lot of people, but nobody has thanked Rita, <laughs> and so I would like to just say that, um, you know, I, I, I'm the instructor in this class, but I'm not the one who has made every detail of this program work, that has been Rita. And so let us give a huge round of applause <laughs> to Dr. Rita Blake. Um, so uh, with that, thank you, to, thank you to all the students for your amazing presentations. Thank you to all the parents and friends and family who either came here or were watching on the live stream. Uh, and we've got a little uh, gift for you out in the lobby, and then we can all go upstairs to the sixth floor uh, with the elevators on this side, or you could take the stairs if you wanted to take a little walk, up to the sixth floor patio for a little bit of lunch and uh, some time to say our goodbyes before we all depart. So thank you, everyone. Great job.